Good Monday morning of the fifth week of the year. I think that's what he said. I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's the fifth week. This is actually a Saturday morning, okay? It's 4.30 right now. I got up at 3.30 panicking because I forgot to do these videos on Thursday and Friday. I was swamped at school, to tell you the honest to God truth. Not a amount of work, but swamped by the intensity what I had to do. I was on a couple of very controversial committees dealing with honesty stuff. and It's just tricky, okay? Whatever it's worth. And my classes. So I was not thinking about these videos and... <laughs> All of a sudden, this boy said, oh, my God, I didn't do it. I got to do my videos. <laughs> See? Oh, anyway. Anyhow. So I had to look it up. I said, what is this anyway? Because I do these things. Believe it or not, why I panic is beyond me. I do these two weeks in advance. So even in the worst case scenario, you got a lot of time. But nonetheless, leave it to me. <laughs> when there was a book called We Neurotics, I think the guy had me in mind. Whatever. Anyhow, good morning to everyone that's watching these videos. You know, I'm really grateful that you do. I'm honored by it. I'm surprised also. There's quite, apparently quite a number of you that watch this on a kind of faithful basis. One of my friends in Alaska said she, she has me for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> in other words, with her cup of coffee. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'm grateful for such loving friendship and fidelity. It's a form of fidelity, active fidelity, when you look forward to being with someone else, even if it's through a vicarious medium, such as a video. It's neat, isn't it? I'm not much in technology, but I got to tell you, this is I'm grateful for it. Then I'm able to just share whatever little thought I have. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's more sharing of company, to tell you the truth. That's how I feel this morning. Look at me, I'm, I'm burning up the clock right now. Everybody's two minutes of just saying good morning to you. You know, it's interesting in a way, today's readings is Genesis. That's some of the trickiest readings in the Bible. Misunderstood, misabused. You know, I'm no authority in the book of Genesis at all, at all. It is not a piece of easy reading, and it ain't necessary. I mean, let's face it. It's, it's a, to me, it's a poetic story of the beauty of the earth and God's creation of what is truly beautiful and good. But still, a world in which there is a conundrum. You could imagine, in other words, why is there, why is there evil in the world? When God says at the end of, in Genesis 1, he saw it all and that it was good, and it is good. But so is the dialectic, the, di the dynamism of life, which entails death. You see, we're going to see death introduced through the sin of Adam, but that's death of the soul. How could there have been non-death in a biological universe? See, these guys aren't jerks, they're poets. And they're looking at the human experience. And the conundrum is that we are called into the beauty of life, and yet we as humans have fouled it up. We're always in constant need of redemption. See? And yet we are created in his image and likeness. What does that mean? It means that we are created with intelligence and freedom. We're the only creatures we know. Besides, you know, Unless you believe in, I'm sure, is there some other form of intelligent life? And you know, oh, no, no, I don't care. Okay? But I know we are. And in that sense, we are like, we are like God. Because we can know and we can choose. See? And we can choose and we can know the good and choose the good. Or we can reject it, see? And God can't do a thing about it. Like God, our freedom is radical to our existence because we are free creatures, and God created us that way. I think when you read Genesis, I think a great story of the beauty of the universe. And from the very beginning, God chose to create an entire universe to uh, an entire universe in order to, uh, for, you, for mankind, humankind, intelligence life to, ev to evolve, intelligent life to evolve. He created a universe that was dynamically evolving towards self-recognition, self-consciousness, and freedom. The story, the story of the universe is intrinsically anthropocentric, that it is aimed ultimately at humankind and Christo-anthropocentric Christ. I think the incarnation was the original intention 
of God creating the universe. He wanted to, to create a universe he could join. <laughs> that sounds nutty, but it's not. I don't think, I think, say, I take seriously the, the uh, prologue of John. God creates the universe for him and to, and through him and for him, the second person of the Trinity. I believe that. I believe the universe was created for the incarnation. The incarnation wasn't there to bail us out. It was the whole purpose of it, to transform time into eternity, finite beauty into infinite beauty, mortality into immortality, life, life's limits until its unlimitedness in the in Christ in. And uh, I, and, and I don't want to say paradise. I don't like that word, but I, I said paradisal. You know, I believe that. I believe you read Genesis that way. That's how I read it. And also, I can see these guys who are writing this, these poets, scratching their head. How did it get so dark and screwed up? How do we, we get the mess of it? And they explain it. They try to show it's, it's human. The sinfulness doesn't come from God. It comes from us. But the beauty and the ultimate beauty is rooted in God and God's creation of the universe. Even the dynamism of, and the continuum of life and death. I think the wilderness taught me that. I know my friends in Alaska, and especially in Helena, are watching this. I learned more from Alaska, not only Alaska, I have to say Northern Ontario, but it was my friend Bill Ritchie, God rest him, a Native American. Half Ojibwe, as I think his tribe was, and half Scottish and 1,000% a G way, you know, he had a no bill and his son Lark. I hunted with Lark, I guided with Lark. And then you had a no Lark. 25% a G way, I think that's the tribe. 25% Scottish and 50% Milanese, Italian, like me. His mother is fully Italian. She came from Italy. Yeah, he was 1000% Native American. One of the great privileges of my life was to be with Bill Ritchie and Lark in the wilderness. Because it's not what they taught me, it's what they were. And I saw how beautiful the wilderness is. And yet it is also wildly dangerous. You could go from predator to prey in a drop of a hat. <clears throat> and yet it's that's part of her beauty. I remember uh, in, uh, in Alaska with my friend Tim Weibscher from the Park Service up there, he was the head of it. And we were in grizzly country. And I remember that exact, exact spirit. I love the wilderness of Alaska, but I'm also fearful of it because it's so vastly beyond my skills. When a Native American would have walked through there without blinking an eye, I'm there. I told Tom, don't get out of sight. I never want you out of my sight. I get lost in the sacristy in church. See? And we were out there. We had our rifles. We were scouting for a, for a moose. Actually, he had a moose tack. So we're looking for moose. <clears throat> And I remember him pausing, and he said, do you smell that? We were really in a dense wilderness, about 100 miles northeast of Fairbanks. You think about how deep that wilderness, there's nothing next to it. You got, next stop is north of that is there. You brush out, you're going north. There ain't nothing. There are no more roads. There ain't nothing. You're out there, okay? <laughs> and I said to him, no. He says, I can smell something. There's a dead, dead there's an animal down, a dead animal, probably a dead moose. <clears throat> I said, why? What's the concern? He says, the grizzlies are probably on it. It's a grizzly on it, which means we're facing a charge. We could be facing a, a grizzly charge. We couldn't have been more. If he could smell it, we were no more than 30 or 40 yards away, but you couldn't see anything. The woods were so heavy. I never felt so, af not afraid. I felt the fear of a prey animal in the presence of a predator. I remember as I slipped my rifle off my shoulder and I slipped to safety. And I said, oh, God, don't let me mess. Don't let me mess. And I wasn't from protecting me that I would hit the bear before he got to Tom or Tom would get him before he got to me. Yeah, that's a true story. Yet it's beautiful. I love that story because it was nothing. We walked away. But I know what it's like to instantly switch from predator to prey. That's the wilderness. That's life. And the wilderness is such a teacher of life. You see her beauty, but also her treachery, as it were, you feel your mortality. You feel your creatureliness when you're in the wilderness. And it teaches you so much about the beauty of life. It's precious life. It's how precious it is and how fragile. You learn to see and love the beauty. That's the truth. That is the truth. I owe so much to the people who guided me through the wilderness. My friends, my Alaskan friends. 
the Native Americans, who taught me to see and feel the wilderness, both as predator and prey, a member to Aldo Leopold, a citizen of the earth, a citizen of the world, not a dominating one, but a citizen.